For some reason that we'll probably never fully understand, an extraordinary outpouring of energy began to occur around the year 1100. It was so powerful and so passionate that it transformed the way the world looked and thought about God, about justice and power, about women, love and art. This story starts with the almost unbelievable life of the woman we will come to know as Eleanor of Aquitaine. Eleanor had virtually everything this life can grant. Sunlit beauty, inherited power and wealth on a phenomenal scale. Kings as husbands, kings as sons. She lived an epic life in the middle of a whirlwind. Entangled with five mightily powerful men who fought for more than a century to control Western Europe. Surrounding them is an incredible array of people who lived in that world doing incredible things, from building stone cathedrals that streamed with sunlight, to fighting two crusades, to inventing fictional characters we still read about. We know of only a few of them, and what we do know of even these favoured few is limited by their records and our own comprehension. Come with us as we journey to meet Eleanor of Aquitaine, Henry Plantagenet, Richard Lionheart, King John, and all the remarkable people surrounding them. To be in their presence is an exhilarating experience. Won't you join us? Welcome back to Lion's Forge. My name is Beckett, and I want to tell you a story. An epic, true story of five kings and the Lion Queen. Episode 7, The Thunderbolt. The year is 1145. Louis had been in the field off and on, fighting in Champagne for two years. Now, after the bitter stench of the burning of Vitry, he came back to Paris in the early summer of 1144. All the death and ruination of the past two years suffered for nothing. The war sagged into history. Louis's insistent choice as Bishop of Bourges lost. Count Theobald kept his lands. Eleanor's sister Alex was the scourge at the core of Louis's troubles, and hadn't even given the Vermandois family a son in return. Even more maddening, Eleanor, who had persuaded Louis to face down the Blois family and the Pope for her sister's sake, hadn't produced a son of her own after seven years of marriage. Intriguingly, 1144 was the year Louis gave away Eleanor's wedding gift to him, the rock crystal vase that had once belonged to her grandfather. The lucky recipient, told that the gift came from his sovereign as a great gift of love, was Suger. Eleanor was not mentioned as joining in the gift. The thinking at court had to be that these Provençal princesses were cursed. They may have even feared it themselves. There's a legend that Eleanor gave birth to a stillborn boy, a disaster the dominant cleric, Bernard of Clairvaux, brutally and publicly attributed to her ungodliness. Another version of the post vitry story again pits the volatile pair against each other, Eleanor allegedly weeping over her childlessness, leading Bernard to tell her he would pray for her to bear a child if she would beg God's forgiveness for inciting Louis to rebel against the Pope. Yet, as usually is the case for all of us, fortune had not entirely deserted Louis, not even in this awful year. Following his capitulation to the Pope after Vitry, his excommunication and the accompanying interdict were lifted. The war with the House of Blois ended. Whether or not thanks to the prayers of Bernard of Clairvaux, Eleanor would at last be pregnant, twenty-two years old and seven years married. And great events that would overtake European squabbles were slowly gathering force on the other side of the Mediterranean. The grandfathers of this generation had been part of the First Crusade that had electrified the known world a half-century before. Every educated person of Louis and Eleanor's day knew of that splendid triumph, which began when Saracen warriors from the depths of Antolia, known to us now as modern Turkey, 
emerged from their dry, mountainous homelands to harry and frighten the Byzantine world. The Byzantine emperor had begged his European peers for help, leading to a four-year epic that ultimately involved kings and popes, thousands of knights, European nobles, Christian pilgrims, and Muslim warriors. The crusade was one of the few that yielded positive consequences for the West, among them the Christian reconquest of Jerusalem after some 450 years in Muslim hands, and the creation of four crusader states. Strung in a thin belt up and down the eastern coast of the Mediterranean, from the tip of the Red Sea to the banks of the Euphrates, these outposts of European Christianity, Edessa, Antioch, Tripoli, and the Kingdom of Jerusalem, stared into the ceaselessly boiling kettle of the surrounding Saracen kingdoms. By 1144, as Louis examined his conscience in Vitry's aftermath, the Crusader states were more than 40 years old. Given the constancy of the Muslim threat to all four of these insecure outposts of Christianity, one would rationally assume that they would have long since formed a vigilant, united alliance. One would be wrong. The four monarchs of this Christian kingdom of the East did virtually nothing but quarrel among themselves, each keenly alert for promising ways to avoid committing his troops and his coffers to fights that seemed to threaten only his European rivals, each longing to grab more territory, wealth, and power for himself. The chronicler William of Tyre, a teenager living in Jerusalem at the time, wrote of such personal animosity between Joslin of Edessa and Raymond of Antioch that they, quote, rejoiced in each other's catastrophes and were made glad by the other's mishaps, end quote. The Muslim threat was almost an afterthought. The county of Edessa was the first of the crusader states to emerge from the drama of the First Crusade. Born in a swirl of untimely deaths, improbable alliances, and probable murder. Its founding father was Baldwin of Boulogne, a French nobleman's youngest son whose good manners overlaid the instincts of a 17th century pirate. Already 40 by the time he left on crusade, accompanied by his two older brothers and heiress wife, he sold much of his property in Europe to finance his family's expedition. His wife died on the trip leaving him little reason to return to a dull future back home. Determined to make his fortune, Baldwin accepted an invitation from the kingdom of Edessa, a sun-baked living relic of ancient empires that had already passed its 1400th birthday. Baldwin ingratiated himself to an exceptional degree with Edessa's ruler, who ultimately named this foreign newcomer his adopted son and heir. Soon thereafter, the unlucky incumbent was cut down by an assassin, leaving Baldwin, so recently just another mercenary with uncertain prospects, the new Count of Edessa. Historians still debate whether Baldwin was a remarkably fortunate man or had possibly decided to give luck a leg up. Northernmost of the Crusader states, little more than a sparsely populated collection of trading towns jutting like an outstretched thumb, surrounded on three sides by Muslim warlords, Edessa was perpetually stressed by raiding attacks and fear of worse. Its most alarming enemy was the ruler of neighboring Aleppo, Imad Adin Zengi, who had coolly fought Europeans across the Middle East for twenty years. Zengi was tough as nails, a general said to be capable of yanking his own men out of a line of march and crucifying them for disobeying an order. In addition to his belief in really tight discipline, he was decisive. Like an Arab George Patton, he moved whenever opportunity presented itself. In November of 1144, opportunity blossomed in the country's main city, also named Edessa when its army marched out of its walls under Edessa's current ruler, a pleasure-loving type named Joslin. Various explanations exist for this debatable decision. 
Some think Jocelyn intended to harass Zengi by cutting his supply lines or attacking one of his strongholds, while others point to prior excursions and conclude Jocelyn was heading off for an early holiday debauch down the road. Whatever the reasoning, it was a spectacularly bad call. Left with only a smattering of mercenaries whose devotion to the cause was offset by their haphazard pay, and a civilian population of tradesmen, women, and children, Edessa, considered the strongest fortress in the whole of the Crusader states, was defenseless. Zengi, who some say did give the city several opportunities to surrender, was a determined and dauntingly effective besieger. According to vivid eyewitness accounts, Zengi's army came up out of the countryside from every direction, entirely surrounding the city. The Turks battered the walls, poured a rain of arrows into the city, and dug trenches under the bridge outside the north gate. No one could escape, and no supplies could come in. People inside the city were exhausted by constant labor on the defensive lines, by hunger, by nightmarish fear. This went on for a solid month. Day after day of the ceaseless pounding shudder of battering rams and entrenching machines coming closer and closer. Sniper archers picking off anyone they could catch in the open. Starving babies wailing from their cots. Finally, on that terrible Christmas Eve of 1144, Zenki's troops reached the two great defensive towers near the north gate and blew them apart. Whatever the inhabitants had dreaded as the sea shredded their nerves, the reality was infinitely worse. Muslim troops slashed thousands to death with their great curved swords, their robes dull red to the shoulder with blood. Other thousands were trampled when terrified mobs tried to make it to the citadel on the south side of the city, where they found locked gates. Witnesses said that 10,000 children were taken into slavery. Every Westerner found in the devastated city not already dead was killed. Everything of value was looted. By December 27th, just 70-odd hours after its walls had been breached, Edessa was finished as a European presence. Zengi, the first Muslim prince to conquer a crusader state, would be dead within two years of his stunning victory, murdered by a slave. Europeans perhaps gleaned some bitter pleasure when they heard about it. In an age where men on horseback and ships with sails were the fastest things on earth, it took weeks for news of the calamity of the great tower of smoke in Edessa to make its meandering way to Europe, carried by traders, army couriers, stragglers, and refugees. From port to port, and then overland across Italy, over the Alps, and one by one to all the noble courts of Europe. When the reality was finally understood, it was a thunderbolt. European Christianity's assumed place in the East, since it had won back Jerusalem two generations before, was suddenly at almost unimaginable risk. The real and potential blows were reckoned up with disbelief. Loss of access to the holy places, loss of Egyptian cotton and exotic oranges, dates, and olives, Loss of treasure, of life, of certainty that the world worked a certain way. People stirred uneasily. It had happened fifty years before at the time of the First Crusade, and now it was happening again. Armies from the West would be summoned to marshal themselves against Islam. They were called by God to rescue the sacred places, to march, to fight, and, if they must, to die to save the priceless Holy Land. Zengi blasted his way into Edessa on Christmas Eve 1144. Even before coherent accounts of the disaster arrived in Europe the following summer, the church was grappling with the death of a pope. The new pontiff, Eugenius III by name, 
was utterly inexperienced as the leader of Christendom when the West first learned the terrible news of Edessa's fall. Being elected to the papacy in 1145 was a dubious prize. Popes of the era weren't only religious leaders. They were also the temporal rulers of the papal states, a swath of central Italy centered on Rome. Popes of the 12th century endured wearying turmoil decade after decade, tormented by a succession of rival antipopes and notoriously short lifespans. Thanks to a swirl of rival claimants, political pressures, furiously contested papal elections, and untimely deaths, there had been 22 different popes in the 90 years before Eugenius was seated on the papal throne. Many popes barely entered the Lateran Palace before they were carried back out, dead. Eugenius's two immediate predecessors had each survived less than a year. Papal mortality was a consequence of the very real stresses of life in medieval Rome. That ancient, fabled capital had been unstable for years. A dizzying array of factions fed on rumor and demagoguery. Roman citizens weren't shy about expressing their feelings about anything that caught their attention, from the newest reports of papal corruption to doings on Capitoline Hill, where the Roman Senate still prided itself on its descent from the fabulous days of antiquity. When sufficiently riled, mobs took to the streets, and they were prepared to shed some blood. Eugenius's immediate predecessor died from a rock thrown at his head during a melee. Another recent pope had been ferociously attacked, the furious crowd reportedly intent on ripping out his eyes and tongue. Urban II, who had preached the successful First Crusade in 1095, wasn't able to set foot in Rome for years after his election. Eugenius himself spent only some six months in the capital in eight years as head of the Catholic Church. Popes accordingly often reached for military protection from willing kings, which meant that Catholicism might find its leader in France one year, then in Rome for a few months, then in some German refuge. Each new site was lit by a different political sun. All of this was heightened by complex, ever-changing, often antagonistic relationships between any pope and virtually any of the great lords of Europe. Noblemen were forever struggling with the church, sometimes over a marriage that badly needed to be annulled, sometimes over a quarrel with the local bishop as to who had better rights to the garbled bequest of a dying man. Popes in their turn would beg protection against barbarians, antipopes, and princes with whom they were on currently unfriendly terms, but then had to face the reality that the strong man behind the guardian army wanted something in return. Relations between the Pope and the German ruler, the Holy Roman Emperor in particular, had reached combustion stage over the Emperor's firm belief that in exchange for the security his armies provided the papacy, Popes could be dismissed and replaced at his pleasure. A pope with sufficiently steely resolve could retaliate by excommunicating the annoying emperor, king, duke, or earl, not to mention threatening the thunderbolt of interdict on his lands, but might then be well advised to lock himself inside the ancient Roman mausoleum-turned-fortress called Castel Sant'Angelo on the banks of the Tiber and see what he could do about summoning up an army of his own. And so Eugenius arrived a new player on an unstable stage, an Italian monk who had risen quickly through the church's ranks. While some contemporaries found him thoughtful, wise, and generous in spirit, he was described, dismissively or admiringly is hard to tell, as innocent and simple by the man who really dominated the Catholic Church of the day, Bernard of Clairvaux. A tornado fit for the century. A holy, masterful, eloquent scold, one day to be considered a saint, Pope Eugenius virtually disappears under the scorching dominance of his mentor Bernard's personality. Bernard was an aristocrat's son, but outward appearances meant nothing to him, and he held the passionate belief they meant nothing to God. 
What counted with Bernard was the purity of one's inner life, the direct soul contact between God and man, won by meditation and, above all, faith. Bernard was no less rigorous in regard to earthly matters, although we think he had one soft spot, since he might have popularized the proverb, Love me, love my dog. Aside from this unexpected fondness for dogs, Bernard held only the fiercest beliefs, and his powers of persuasion, along with his ferocious self-discipline, seem limitless. We may well be thankful that he lived and preached before the era of mass media. A Bernard of Clairvaux with a talk show of his own gives one serious pause. As it was, his was a fantastically busy life that took him everywhere in Europe. Paris was the stage for his fiery battles with Abelard, that blasphemous champion of human logic rather than Bernardian faith, Rome his platform for influencing the whole of Christendom. The spectacular force of his character first came to light when he chose to abandon the pleasures of a nobleman's life to become a Cistercian monk as a young man. Bernard talked almost three dozen friends and relatives into going with him, including four of his own brothers and possibly even his father. Joining the Cistercians would hardly seem a logical destination for this son of the nobility. The order had been founded only a few years before to counter the perceived spiritual laxity of the long-established Benedictines and their ties to the largest and most powerful abbey in Europe, a monastery in Burgundy called Cluny. Dating back more than 200 years, Cluny had been blessed with a series of brilliant Benedictine abbots who acquired international status as statesmen in their day. Everyone in the medieval world came to know of Cluny, and since power followed influence in the 12th century, as naturally it does in ours, the monastery became as rich as a dukedom. Its inhabitants sought after participants in the world's messy affairs. Suger himself was a Benedictine. The Cistercians, however, weren't impressed. They were outraged by what they considered the pride, ambition, and easy comfort of life among the Benedictines. Rather like a medieval religious version of the U.S. Marine Corps, the Cistercians offered serious young men like Bernard tough lives of manual labor, silent meditation, and genuine poverty. The Benedictines and the Cistercians very quickly squared off as entrenched competitors in the earthly plane that Bernard supposedly detested. One of his rare surviving personal letters bemoans that the abbot of Cluny somehow managed to lure Bernard's cousin Robert away from the spiny embrace of the Cistercians. At the age of 25, after just a few years as a monk in the still young Cistercian order, Bernard was sent to found a new monastery in the wilds of northeast France. It was named Clairvaux, Bright Valley. Shaped and driven by Bernard's passion for order, simplicity, and discipline, the Cistercians of Clairvaux quickly became a force to rival the Benedictines of Cluny. Known for physical austerity above and beyond even the Cistercian norm, as well as intellectual brilliance and clarity, Clairvaux was soon considered one of the powerhouses of medieval Catholicism. It eventually housed some 700 monks and gave birth to hundreds of other chapters from Ireland to Romania. Pope Eugenius had been part of its community. Even Louis Capet's brother Henry, a prince of France, gave in to its pull. The smart, Tough Cistercians also displayed a talent for making money that would have pleased any Victorian industrialist. Cistercian monks forged iron, devised an early type of chemical fertilizer, were renowned for the quality of their wines, crops, and livestock, and actively engaged in the international wool trade. Trappist monks of today, known for the silence and simplicity of their lives, not to mention their beer and jam, or a later branch of the Cistercian order. Cistercians even became sought-after talents in the realm of architecture. 
Bernard disdained Suger's St. Denis Cathedral in Paris as so flamboyant that it interfered with attentive prayer, so his disciples obediently developed a more restrained beauty for their own buildings, down to such modest structures as their handsome stone barns. Their fame as builders spread. Many Cistercians, including Bernard's brother Eckard, were hired as managers for construction projects across the continent. With the grand achievement of Clairvaux at his back, Bernard would remain its abbot until his death. And despite his pronounced scorn for worldliness and other priests, Bernard flung himself into the century. Traveling incessantly, capable of riveting oratory combined with an unblinking understanding of how the world worked, he became known in every corner of Europe. He hounded brilliant Abelard to his death on charges of heresy. There are stories that he brought Queen Eleanor to humiliated tears. He fought earthly kings and princes incessantly on behalf of the papacy, demanding full scope for the Pope's authority. His great admiration for the warrior monks who called themselves the Knights Templar was key to their eventual wealth and influence. He wrote, turning out volume after volume of mystical thought along with practical advice on the religious life. He excoriated the rich and rebuked the moderate. He made two men pope, and those men, particularly the modest Eugenius, gave him access to the pulpit of St. Peter, the core of Western Christendom. By 1145, famous, respected, and feared, Bernard's greatest triumph was just over the horizon. We've come to the end of our story for the time being. I am Beckett Arnold, narrating from the book Lion's Forge, adapted for us by the author, Karen Markle Knapp. Thank you to Francis Butt for voicing our introduction. If you like what you hear, please give us a rating, follow our channel, and share us with your friends. Most importantly, please join us again August 21st for the next episode of Lion's Forge, available everywhere you get your favorite podcasts. And now streaming on YouTube with video episode trailers and on Facebook, where you can ask questions, leave reviews, and interact with me.